Okay, so a little bit about my background. I've been doing uh, 3D for about 15 years, for the past 10 of which I've been a character artist and freelancing primarily in Chicago, and then I moved on to Los Angeles to work in the entertainment industry about three years ago. So while I was in Chicago, it was a lot of commercial work. So I did a lot of packaging, McDonald's, uh, secret deodorant, shampoo bottles, the odd agency job, um, like, you know, gum with a bikini, sure. Um, but this wasn't really appealing to me uh, as much. A lot of, uh, you know, stuff I wanted to do was characters. And I got to do some, but there wasn't as much character work in Chicago. Um, I did work for Harley Davidson for a couple of years, doing a lot of Harley Davidson bikes. So I learned a ton from that. But still, I wanted to create content that would have more of an emotional connection with people and kind of tell stories with images and try to get more into entertainment. So I decided once I got married about three years ago that I would you know, come down to LA and I would try something different. And the first 3D print I ever did was this guy right here. It was a little cake topper for my own wedding. Uh, painted that up and put that on the cake and it was very popular um, and that just really got me addicted. I decided, you know what, I'm going to move to Los Angeles, I'm going to start doing more entertainment related work, but I'm going to incorporate this new technology, 3D printing, into my lexicon and just make it a niche that I can really fit into. So. The results of that was that I started getting a lot of uh, 3D print related work. So let me show you guys some of the stuff I've been uh, working on. One of the cool projects was uh, by Nickelodeon. Nick Jr. actually, uh, they wanted a trophy for their producers for this TV show, Fresh Beat Band of Spies. So I worked with the uh, 2D artist Ernie who gave me uh, this drawing and I had to figure out how to get all of these characters sculpted and made into one trophy. It's great when you work with the 2D artist that can give you uh, the full you know, turnaround of a character, makes it a lot easier to sculpt. And this was their idea for the base. So the way I did that was first by just planning. Each of these pieces would be printed separately and then assembled onto a base. So I started by you know, first the plan, then the sculpt, got some notes, edited it, tweaked it, refined it, and then we had the finished models for the trophy. There you can see all of them. And that's one of the main things I'm going to be talking about in this webinar class today, is oftentimes we as you know, artists want to print really, really big things and our printer build volumes aren't that big. Form 2 in particular, I think its build volume is uh, about six inches by six inches by seven inches. So sometimes when you want to print larger than that, you have to learn how to separate pieces and then join them together. So that's how we did that. And then put all the pieces together and there's the final thing. So that was a cool job, but it was still relatively small. I'll switch to my webcam here for a second. Uh, I wanted to show you really quickly the uh, finished trophy and how it was all put together. So all of these pieces come out and they can snap into the bottom. And that's how you have to think about 3D printing. It's not just modeling skills, you have to learn to be an engineer as well. So let's move on then to the next thing. I'll share screen again. All right, one of the coolest projects I got to work on last year, uh, and again, something that we're gonna be talking about printing big, pause this, was at Alliance Studios, I got to be part of the team that worked on the giant Overwatch collectibles. Um, I primarily worked on Genji, and can talk to you a bit about the process. So first, when Alliance was approached with the job, they had to figure out the logistics, because usually it takes them about a year to make one of their full scale statues for Blizzard or Riot or whoever they work for. Um, and this time they only had maybe four months to deliver three of those giant statues. So it was a lot of, you know, figuring out, can we staff up in time to make this happen? Can we build these models from scratch? And oftentimes they sculpt everything by hand. 
but this was impossible in the timeline, so they had to rely on 3D printing in order to make it happen. So they figured out the workflow, they brought me in and a bunch of other people as contractors to start working on this, and we got the models from the modeling team at Blizzard, and then my job was to take the Genji model and figure out how and where to slice it, to maybe make it look a bit more articulated like a toy. So I added a couple of things into the model and then prepped all the pieces out for print separately because this printer that uh, did this job was about three feet by three feet. And you can see some of the pieces here that came out of it. Look at the scale on that thing. Keep this open. Let's see here. So a lot of these pieces, once they were printed, needed to have fiberglass put on the inside of them, uh, cleaned up pretty thoroughly, and then painted. You know, so they all were hand painted. They masked everything off and did an amazing job on all of them. They even put electronics on the inside and sound and like metal framing to mount them onto each other. You can see how it was packed for shipping and then assembled on location. So this is in Vegas at the shop called EGADS, which built the boxes for this job. And then here's the pictures of the final result. David, do you, know what, was, do you know what printer they use for that? Hollywood, California, right here in front of the Jimmy Kimmel studio. Uh, Genji, I believe, was uh, Paris. And uh, Farah was in uh, Korea. So this was a really cool project to be a part of, not just seeing how 3D printing would impact the industry for large-scale you know, statues in the future, but it's already doing it right now. And it's very cool when you get to work on an opportunity or when you get to work on a project that's you know, so loved by so many people. So that was really cool. And we'll be talking about a lot of the same techniques in the class. We're gonna be talking about 3D printing at all scales. And what I wanna focus on right now is just larger than your build area prints. Let's see here. Cool stuff I can show you guys. This is a job I did last year through my own company, 3D Smiths. And a client came to me and said they wanted an evil Knievel statue for a pizzeria in Las Vegas that they're opening, uh, that his son was opening. So I did this quick sketch. It was approved. And then we moved on to the sculpt. And me and another friend, Daniel DeLeon, did this whole sculpt, evil Knievel standing on the pizza. Here's the face close up. And here's the finished result. It's a life-size statue. So we did a 3D print prototype and then this wasn't actually 3D printed. It was milled out of foam and then covered to make it look like bronze. So not so much an additive manufacturing technique. It's more of a subtractive one, but still goes to show you how you can make something in ZBrush and then start seeing it you know, in full scale. here all right another thing i wanted to show you guys oh this is pretty cool so i got to work at uh aaron sims creative last year as well on a few different projects which i can't show all of them i worked on rampage the new movie with the rock um giant monsters and i got to do some stuff for uh 3d print stuff i got to set them up with four form labs printers and print out the Demogorgon from Stranger Things. You can see this happy little fella right here. And then also uh, uh, Aquaman, the new DC movie. So I got to print a giant like 24 inch sculpt of that as well. And a lot of the reasons for me getting these gigs is because I was one of the few people who was already you know, showing 3D printed materials and keying and slicing and all this stuff in my portfolio. All right, so last thing I'll show is 
another project from last year, which was at a Stupid Buddy Studios, and I got to work on Super Mansion. And Stupid Buddy does a lot of the, well, they're the primary modelers, animators, they do Robot Chicken. And Super Mansion is their new TV show, which is up now on Crackle. And it's got all these really cool puppets. The idea is basically a superheroes kind of reality show where they all live in one house. And Brian Cranston does the lead voice acting along with Keegan-Michael Key and a couple of other really cool actors. So I wanted to share a bit about this process. Um, for, everything's modeled in ZBrush and Maya. Here you can see my coworker Grace sculpting up a character. Here's some of the sculpts that I did for the show that you can see now in season two. And characters and props, all these pieces are 3D printed. Here's Annie holding some of the 3D prints. You can zoom in and see the close-up of a whole tray of hands. And here's all the hands all cleaned up. And now this is 3D printing for stop-motion animation. So very different from the giant Overwatch collectibles. These guys are pretty tiny. But what's cool about this is you can, you know, it's a completely different process to create these puppets, but these puppets use 3D prints directly that are painted and then animated. So here's a set for stop motion animation, and here's the puppet. So that's a 3D printed head, it has 3D printed arms, 3D printed boots. Uh, the body is usually 3D printed once. Um, let me show you. And then you create a silicone mold for the body so it's all flexible and an armature inside. So we're gonna cover a little bit of this stuff in the class as well. Just gonna to try to overload you guys with all of my experiences. All right. Okay, so I wanna talk about uh, my current gig right now. I'm working at a studio called Three Black Dot in downtown LA. It's a pretty cool, interesting studio. It's a marketing agency slash content creator for um, a lot of high name YouTubers in the Let's Play space. And so thanks to them for letting me show some of the cool stuff I'm working on. In addition to being their 3D character artist right now on their video games and VR experiences, I'm also leading their vinyl toy workflow. So I'm setting it all up for them so that we can actually make lots of little vinyl toys of a lot of their uh, products. So one of the games I'm working on right now is called Dead Realm. And it's gonna be out in a couple of weeks from uh, Steam pre-release. And it's a haunted house themed game where you can, there's a bunch of different mini games in there, but uh, you can be hunted by a ghost, you can be the ghost and hunt other humans, multiplayer online, you can play hide and seek, or you can actually have guns and try to take out the ghost. So it's a pretty interesting game. And I got to make some of the ghosts, this one you see on the screen here, we call her the librarian. Some other uh, modelers worked to create some of these other assets and I got to refine each of them. And what I wanna talk today about specifically is the ghost all the way on the right here, the scary cr clown in the convict outfit. His name is Tiny. And Tiny is one of the characters in uh, Dead Realm. He's a ghost that you can be or that you can uh, get chased around by. And it's a pretty scary game, but what they wanted was to create collectibles for Dead Realm to see, you know, run through the entire workflow of vinyl toys. So my job was to make, you know, Tiny here all 3D printable. So I wanna show you guys how I made that happen. So hold on, I'm gonna stop the screen share for a second and pull up ZBrush. And I'll do a little demo. Let me load it up. Uh, does anyone have any questions at this point? They can throw them in the chat. Or uh, add the questions in the Q&A as well, and then we'll answer those at the end of the webinar. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. Okay, hide this away. 
All right, let me share the screen again. Okay, cool. Do you guys see ZBrush on my screen? Yes. Sweet. Okay, so this is the game model that we used for high res detail for Tiny. And you can see it doesn't really have any hair. And this is pretty much just used for the high res detail, which is then uh, turned to create normal maps and the textures that we use in the game. So my first job was to get him posed. And when you have a high res asset, that can be sometimes hard so because you, in ZBrush, you have to manually select the areas you want and then you know, rotate and transpose into place. So the first thing I wanted to do was just get a feel for the pose. And I did that with the Maya file. So we have the Dead Realm game asset here. And that, this is the tiny game model. And I used the rig to quickly pose him up into something that I thought would look really cool. And once I had that figured out, then I came back and decided to match this model to the pose. The result for that was this right here. And then I sculpted it up. Does everyone know what I'm talking about matching the pose? In ZBrush? Let's see. Okay. Yeah, this is this course will cover a lot of ZBrush stuff. And ZBrush is an excellent 3D printing tool and modeling tool. So I use it for a lot of my process. So this was the game model. And then I basically turned on both of these guys. And then I moved and rotated him until he matched. So something like this, I'll show you really quickly. There you can see I'm rotating his arm into place. I can move it a little bit. I can check what I'm doing. And just using this same process of mask, unmask, select, rotate, I was able to pose this character. And then that's what you see right here. So I'll zoom in a bit. And one cool thing about this is how I did the hair. So I can show you that. Because as you can see, the original model doesn't have any hair. So I just used the game model hair. But the game model hair here, if I go to display properties, turn off double, you can see it's all single-sided flat shapes. So one cool thing I can show you right now is how I turned these into these. And the way I did it was here's the game model hair. And the easiest way to do this, you can check out in polyframe mode. The easiest way to do this is to just simply go to morph target in your tool menu, store it, and then go to the deformation tab, scroll down to inflate, and just do an inflation. If you see on the screen, you see what's happening. It's basically just moving itself out. It's still a one piece mesh, flat, but then we're gonna go back to morph target and we're gonna click on this button right here, create difference mesh. And what this does is it takes the original position of the model and then the inflated position of the model and it calculates that middle area and it saves that out as its own tool. And here you can see is the thickened hair. And then from here you can just go back to your main tool, append it on, bring that down. And you can just subdivide it and continue to sculpt. All right. And then this is the final hair after all the sculpting. I try to fill in all the gaps 
and make it pretty printable. So it's inflated quite a bit, but it looks cool in the final print. All right, so as you can see here, if I press polyframe, this is all one solid model. So before, you know, we've done anything, we just have to, you know, get the pose right and sculpt it. And now we have to figure out how we're going to print this. Now what they wanted, if I can show you right here, was a pretty tall print. And this is the crux of a lot of uh, 3D printing and figuring out how to print large is that you can see the form two behind it. The print volume isn't big enough to print tiny in one go because tiny is about nine inches tall, including the base. So in order to print him in you know, multiple pieces, we have to slice him apart and figure it out how we're going to you know, slice him and key him back together. So that's what I'm going to talk about right now a little bit in the webinar. So the first thing to do is to just take uh, some screenshots out of ZBrush and figure out how you're going to slice them apart. So I'll quickly open this in Photoshop and we'll do some quick planning. All right. Okay, so I've got the Photoshop open and I'm going to just create a new layer. Let's try this out. All right, so the first step in creating a model in segments is just planning. You have to think about what's the largest piece and then scale down from there and where you're going to be slicing this character up. There's a thing called natural seams in character models. And in most models, there's places where you can hide the seams. So that's what you have to try to find. In this character, for example, there's a pretty good seam right here on the sides of the arm. So I can think about cutting it right there. I can also see the natural seam right here. So I can either cut at the bottom or the top doesn't really matter, but that's a pretty good seam. And since we want to print the head with the best possible orientation for the printer, um, we can try to separate that as well. So I can cut it right there on the inside of this chain he's wearing. So now we've got one, two, three, four pieces, but this guy's kind of complicated here too. You can see how many nails are sticking out of this bat. So just for proper optimum orientation, I probably cut it right there as well on the inside of the sleeve. So this arm, I'd probably print just in one piece, but this guy I'll separate into two. So we've got one, two, three, four, five pieces now. And We'll probably do the same thing we did here for the feet. We can separate those out. And then our largest piece here is going to be the legs. And this is pretty large right now. So if I'm trying to print this character all in one go, it might be beneficial to also split the legs right down the middle along this seam, or maybe this one. So then we'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine pieces in total. And in this planning stage, this is really important because you can really perfect what you're going to do before you even do it in 3D. Just plan it out. And just think about it. If you find a better way of slicing these characters, maybe you decide this way is better. You can think about it in this 2D stage before moving on to the 3D stage. So that's the first step. And now that I figured out how and where I want to cut it, and I want to have nine pieces, 
for this character, I can start thinking about how long it will take to print and how I can, you know, properly optimize and orient and lay out multiple pieces to print at the same time. So planning goes a long way. Now let's head back to ZBrush. And we'll take a look. Here we go. Whoop. And then we'll start cutting this character up. So the way to do it is just duplicate your mesh first so you have a backup copy. And now you can start thinking about slicing it apart. So I'll show you a few different ways to do this. Not much time in the demo, but we can cover all this stuff. All right. So right now you can see that it's all one poly frame. So it's all one solid piece. And let's try slicing this arm off first, because that looks pretty straightforward. We can switch by holding Control Alt over the brush palette and select our slice curve tool. And slice curve works pretty simply by holding control and shift, you can drag a line and wherever you drop that line, it'll slice your model. And you won't see this change in the model itself, but you can see it in the poly groups. Try doing a couple slices so you can see what's happening. So wherever I slice, you can see it's creating a new poly group. And we can use the slice tool to just come on over here and slice this way along the seam. So it does a pretty good job along the line here, but you can see it still also grabs everything around the sides. So if I control shift and see only this area, you can see the slice cut right through my model. Now this isn't really a big deal because we can just switch from the slice curve now to the select lasso and hide the areas we don't want to be part of this poly group. And only see what we want. So I'm just gonna come around here hide parts of this mesh until I only have the arm visible. Whoop, other way. All right, that looks pretty good. Maybe get rid of that piece. All right, so we, now we've got just this arm, the left arm for Tiny, and we can press Control W to unify it or give it one polygroup color, invert, and then unify this right here by pressing Control W again. And there you can see it's got its own polygroup color. So the arm is now green and the body is all yellow. So now I can control shift click on my arm whoop, and it'll hide it away or invert to just see the whole thing. And the easiest way to do this is to just go to split and you can split hidden. And now you've got two separate subtools. You've got the arm and you've got the body. And so step one, step two, after you've done all the planning in Photoshop is to just go in, hide the parts of the model you don't want to see and polygroup them, you know, hide the parts to you want to invert and then just split it. So you can split the model along the way Way, and you can split it along the bottom, you can split it the, the other arm, the head, all of this off. I'll go just to the arm now. And now we want to fill this hole up so we can go to geometry and dynamesh it. 
And ZBrush is such a great tool for 3D printing because DynaMesh with default settings will make water type meshes. And that's one of the things we'll talk about, you know, in the first week of class, just basics of 3D printing, needing water type meshes, which means there's no holes and it'll, it's one solid piece. And so just by DynaMeshing, it gave me a pretty clean surface and I can come in over here on the sides and kind of just sculpt this st stuff down a bit. Smooth it out. And what we want to do now is plan to key this piece into the other one. And for that, we'll use a tool that we create in the class called an insert mesh keys brush. So you can see here some of the few keys that we'll create in the class, a tapered square key, a round key, and a snap in pin, which is static and able to rotate. I'll load these up on their own so I can show you what we're, I'm talking about. Here's the tapered key. Pretty straightforward, simple thing to create. The round key, the snap-in pin, and the snap-in pin that allows for free rotation. So inside each of these is another mesh. And one is used on the surface as the cutter, and the one on the inside is used as the key. So let me show you what I mean. If we go back to the Dead Realm Clown, and we'll go back to his arm, I'll use my favorite key, the tapered square key, and this is my favorite for static meshes. And I can just draw it on. That's one really cool thing about insert mesh brushes, I can choose the orientation and the position of it. We want to make this key as large as possible so it'll have a lot of surface area to work with. We want to position it right along the center. We can even make it a bit longer if we want. But it really depends. E each model is different. So for this, we could go with something like that or something shorter. Now that I've drawn on my key, I can go to, let's see, split unmasked points, and it'll split off this key piece. And what I meant earlier was that each of these keys that we create in our own Z tool has an inside and an outside piece. So if I do something like click on auto groups and then split it, group split, you can see how there's two pieces. There's this internal piece, which is green now and smaller. And then there's this external piece. The external one we can rename cutter and we can take the key and just merge it onto the onto the arm so we'll just merge that down and i can unify control w so they have the same poly group and i can dynamesh again and there you can see it's now part of the arm so that's one piece almost completely ready to print. It's watertight, it's got a key in it, and it is going to be you know, small enough to fit in our print area. Let's go back to the clown now, the body. And generally I would split it up even further um, before I start this keying process. I would get all my splitting out of the way, but just for demo purposes, I'll show you guys here. If I DynaMesh, just in case, let me save. Never know. Things tend to go awry during a teaching presentation. Okay. And now I will DynaMesh again. Resolution of 300 seems to work for this model. And you can see that filled in that area right there. 
So the same thing, I can come in here with my clay brush, do a little bit of sculpting. All that can be refined later. I can inflate up a little bit. I can just really make this edge as clean as I want to make it. And I can Dynamesh again until it's perfect. But what we're gonna do right now is we'll use the cutter that we separated from our keys. And we're gonna use that to subtract out of the body. And that's how we're going to create the negative shape. And as you can remember, the cutter was a bit larger than the key. So it should, in theory, fit right in once it's printed. So what we're gonna do with this is we've named it cutter. I tend to also just for, you know, double checking sake, I like to go to my MRGB and color the cutters completely red. So I know for sure that's the cutter. From there, we can switch on this little half moon shape and take it below the body in the subtool menu. And I will also group this as a Dynamesh sub. Now you can see I've got a custom user interface, but all of these uh, buttons exist within the tool menu. Uh, group as Dynamesh sub is under polygroups, group as Dynamesh sub. And that's just another way to double check to make sure that it will subtract. And then I'll merge the body down onto my cutter. And I'll do a Dynamesh. And we'll see if this cuts this shape out. Okay, it's taking its time thinking because that's what ZBrush does when you give it a complicated task. I'm not gonna poke it, I'm just gonna wait until it's done resolving because it's working with 4 million polys right now or 21 total in this scene. All right, just checking up on the chat window here. Good, we're getting a bunch of questions in the Q&A as well. We'll be answering those at the end. Okay, let's poke ZBrush and see if it comes back. Ah, so it did do the task. I just had the second duplicate cutter open, so we didn't see it. There's the shape cut out of our mesh. So I can now go and just fill object with the same color. And there you can see the negative that we'll be using to put it back together. So now we've got two pieces, the arm, which has the key in it, and the body, which has the cutout space. And that's the same process we'd recreate all over the mesh. So we'd slice it here, slice it there, slice it there, and within all the natural seams so we can try to hide away the cuts, but then we'd put it all back together. So let me show you some of the pieces. It's kind of like a cooking show where I pre-baked the uh, turkey. I can show you all the pieces that we've got. So there's the head another tapered square key. You'll notice that it's got a circle at the bottom. That's where I've hollowed the piece out. So I don't really have time to go over hollowing in the webinar, but I'll show that in another demo. The head, there's the hand piece with the bowling pin with all the nails in it. You can see how that's done. And that's not hollowed, it's a solid piece because sometimes it's better to print just solid Here's the body. You can see there's one key in it. There's two keys for the bottom and another one for the side. So the reason I made two keys for the bottom is because the legs 
are in two separate pieces. So it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. You think about how you're going to slice it in the planning phase, and then you have to think about how you're going to key it all together and the steps to key it all together. Because for example, the legs would get put together first, and then they would be inserted into the body. So this is just a, a little preview of some of the things we'll be going over in the class, but that's how you key a model to be able to print much larger than your build volume. And here's a little base I made as well for it with a couple of keys sticking up out so that the feet can key onto them, onto the base. And I'll turn all these pieces on. And here's our complete model. So if I do a quick expose, we should be able to see all the pieces. Just like we planned in Photoshop beforehand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pieces total. And from here, I can actually take these models and you know, some of them are hollowed, some of them are solid, and I can export them out, I probably decimate them first in ZBrush under Z plugin decimation master to make them more manageable by the printer. Something like, you know, around 10,000 polys each uh, or less than 100,000 uh, poly count would print with most printers and export it out and at the correct scale for print and set it up in Preform, which is Formlabs printing software because I printed this guy on a Formlabs. So let me go back and show you now some photos of that. Okay, so this was the model you guys were watching. And this was the first print I did, the first print test. And I stopped it midway because I had hollowed it very thin. And we're gonna talk about hollowing later um, in class. And if you want, I did a webinar the previous time around in which I went over hollowing, which is on the Mold 3D Academy YouTube channel. And so you don't wanna hollow a mesh too thin. And sometimes you don't know with ZBrush how thin your mesh is hollowed until you print it out. And this was just going to be too thin. Um, sometimes you have to do sanding and paint work and you want to make sure it feels substantial. So you don't want to hollow away too much material. But this is the second round where I hollowed it to the proper thickness and a quick shot on the printer and then off. And you can see all these pieces can be printed together in one go. This is how they're all laid out. So that saves you time. It actually prints, you know, in one night, I can print all of these pieces rather than printing each individually. But for the large pieces, you still have to print, you know, one piece at a time. There's the body. Here's another shot of the layout. And the next step after that is you separate them from the build plate. You get these guys, and this is stereolithography 3D printing. Um, you have to soak these resin prints in isopropyl alcohol, just get all of the loose resin off of it, and then put it in a UV oven to bake and completely solidify because the laser in the Form 2 and other SLA printers will get it almost all the way there, maybe like 90, 95%, but it'll still be sticky and not completely hard. So it requires some time in a UV oven or just out in the sun. Once it's completely hardened, we can come to the next stage, which is cleanup. And let's see here. Can you guys see on my little webcam screen? Here's a little model that prints fresh from the printer. And you can see some of these you know, pieces are pretty easy to just pop off. You can just rip the supports right off with your fingers. Other times, it's best to take a modeling clipper and some safety glasses. And you can go in and clip away specific pieces and remove the supports that way. And then eventually all of these pieces can just rip off and then you've got your finished model. 
So that's kind of what you have to do with the model like you see on your screen. I'd probably go in with the modeling clipper just to be safe around all these nails and clip away the supports. You sand it down and then here's the finished, all the little pieces, all nine pieces together, actually 10 including the base. And this took about three nights to print out. Um, longest print I believe was just seven or eight hours, which was the legs. And here's the finished model. It's printed in white resin, which isn't ideal for photos because it tends to blow things out a bit. So what we did, what I did next was just spray painted gray, really high tech setup. You can see my cardboard box and uh, Tamiya surface putty primer. It's a pretty good uh, clean coat. And here's the gray prime version where you can see more of the details of the print, about eight inches tall, eight or nine. Do a little turntable for you guys. Just cycle through that. Not the best lighting. I think it's just a window open behind me. But there's the finished result. And right now I don't have it on me because we're getting it painted uh, professionally. And I prepared all of this uh, document right here for the painter. So we can actually sh show actual color selections of what it should be and how it should be painted and gave him some reference of the texture from the model as well. So if you guys do sign up for the class, you'll see later on when this is fully painted. All right, so that's it for the demo section. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I wanna pass it back on to Ed now because I've gone a bit over time and uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to be teaching in the class, which is you got a little taste of. I had to kind of run through a lot of stuff very quickly, but we take our time in the class because it's full eight weeks and we go over the basics of 3D printing, keying, cutting, slicing, articulation, and then I wanna teach you guys how I learned 3D printing by doing a bunch of different projects. So we go over making an accessory, we go over making some jewelry, some wearables, and then the final project, which is your own four inch tall 3D printed uh, sliced up collectible. All right, so uh, let's pass it back to Ed. Do you wanna come back on here, Ed? Yeah, I don't think you could hear me, but uh, Shut them on. so we go. So I have to, pri okay, I have to message uh, Eamon privately here, guys. Um, so real quick, before we get to the q and I just wanted to uh, talk to you guys about, uh, we did want to offer a discount code today if you are interested in taking the class. So it's going to be mold print 17 and registration for the class ends on the 30th. So this is an awesome class, guys. I hope you can make it. It's the first class we created for our online school and it's been a popular one since. So as you can see, Eamon's really good at explaining everything and he goes through it in even more detail in the class. Hope you guys could join us, but I'm gonna stop <laughs> talking about the class and get to the Q&A. So we're gonna go ahead and do the Q&A portion so we can get right. the questions. Sounds good, let's get started. So um, let me go over the couple of questions we had in the chat first. Um, let's see, uh, Matthias asked, do you know what is the amount of resin you use for the clown, about one liter? That sounds right. Um, let me show you what one liter looks like. Okay. All right, so you guys see this little can I'm holding up? This plastic bottle is one liter of resin from Form Labs, and it just slides into the printer and it's about a thousand milliliters. I think for the clown I used almost half of that. So it's not quite one liter. But the one liter can actually stretch a long way. Um, I think that the reason I even used half of that was because the base for the model was printed solid because I wanted a, a lot of weight so that it would be able to balance. But with just this, I can probably print 20 models um, of like maybe four to five inch height. So it, it, it can go a long way depending on the size you're printing. Sometimes if it's a really large print, it can take two or three liters. Okay. All right, so uh, now see if there's anything else in the chat window here. 
Boop, boop, boop. All right, cool. So let's go to the Q&A. All right, so first question was with the Nickelodeon project, was it a one-off piece and no molding was required, no pegs? Um, yeah, so with this project right here, uh, they wanted uh, the trophy as the 3D printed final version. So what you see here is the final print. And I, I 3D printed three of these guys, one for each of the producers and then one for myself. And that's what the final job was, just three 3D prints of, of each. The, um, if I were going to make maybe 10, I would probably go with molding and casting because then it becomes cost effective. I could print one, have it mold and cast, and then make uh, multiples. That's what I did with uh, other jobs. Um, I don't know if I have any examples right here. This boxer, for example, that I did with Steven Silver, we did one print of it, and then it was mold and cast into 50. So we used the molds for that. So it really depends. 3D printing is great for one-offs and two or three, but as soon as you want to print, uh, like as soon as people want like 10 or more copies, it's easier and more cost-effective to mold and cast. All right, Ruben asked, did they use ABS for a huge 3D print? Um, ABS is a type of plastic that you'll see most commonly used in MakerBots and other uh, FBM 3D printers. For the huge prints, I think you're referring to the Overwatch collectibles. And for that, no, those were actually SLA prints. So those were sterilithography, same as the Form 2 machine. It's a liquid resin that when it's hit with a laser hardens and then rises up out of the vat. And this was a very big three foot by three foot sterilithography printer. So yeah, for you, you can use ABS, but ABS has a melting point and it, so does resin obviously, but um, if it were plastic, it would tend to warp and the whole statue would start to shake and melt. So you don't want to use plastic. You want to use a harder resin and then coat it very well for large prints, especially the ones that are going to be outside. All right. Um, James asked, what are some of the major considerations for structuring a business around 3D printed commissions like my company 3D Smiths? All right. So the major considerations is you have to think about, you know, what kind of work do you want to take on? And I'm very picky with what clients I actually choose to move forward on a project with. I don't say yes to everything um, because I only have a limited number of printers. And if I just say yes to every project, I'll constantly be busy, but it may not be the kind of work I want to focus on. With 3D Smiths, I wanted to narrow the focus into characters, you know, character development, toy prototyping, and those kinds of prints. So that's the majority of the work I take on. Um, so the number one thing would be your printers, your inventory and your materials. You want to make sure you have enough resin lying around at all times. So that when a job comes in, you can get going and just focus a bit. You don't have to do printed commissions of all sorts of work. You can choose uh, a specific niche and show that you're an expert at printing and, uh, prepping that kind of work. All right. Uh, Juno asked, what was the milling machine used for the evil Nebel statue? Uh, I'm interested in using subtractive methods for wood sculptures. Uh, it's definitely not a desktop machine uh, that can handle high detail. It's a, it's a very large mill. I'm not sure of the exact name of the machine, uh, but email me later and I can find out for you. Okay. Uh, Janet's asking, can you give ideas about the best workflow in ZBrush? Uh, work in high res then Z remesh or do you use DynaMesh for the keying? Uh, so Janet, yeah, I mean, I showed some of this process uh, that I go through in ZBrush. Um, I tend to start with a low res model and keep it low res as long as I can. Then increase the detail, increase the detail, sculpt in all the high res detail, then slice DynaMesh, key DynaMesh, make sure it's all fitting together and then decimate and then print. So that's my particular workflow. All right, Juno's asking, is there a lot of cleanup process when posing your figures to match the low poly? If so, are any ways to reduce the cleanup process? Um, yeah, there's usually a lot of cleanup because ZBrush, the way it poses is with transposing. And oftentimes high poly models are made at T-pose or relaxed T-pose. 
So they always need to be posed. Um, it depends per model. If it's a mechanical model, sometimes it's easier to just separate pieces and then very quickly pose, and then there's almost no cleanup. Um, like Genji was like that. He was very easy to pose um, and articulate. But if it's a solid organic model, then you may need to do a lot more cleanup. There's no easy way to get around that because the model still needs to be posed. And maybe if you rig it up in Maya and then bring it into ZBrush, you could uh, project. But uh, ZBrush doesn't have a perfect rigging solution yet for posing. All right, so Janet's also asking, do we cover moving joints in a character? Yep, we cover articulation, I believe in week four. So in addition to the keys that I showed you, the snap-in pin, the uh, tapered square and round, we also create a hinge joint, a ball joint, and the snap-in pin is used for a wrist. So we're gonna articulate an arm in week four. All right, let's see, James is asking, what processes do you use to address geometry errors that can arise from Boolean operations like orphan faces and shared edges? All right, I can answer this question by, let's see here. I can try to show you guys what's going on in ZBrush. Let me do a screen share. Okay, do you guys see my screen right now? Oops, just gonna check at the bottom. Okay, cool. So in ZBrush here, what uh, James was asking was the geometry errors that arise from Boolean operations and some of the edges. So you can see I tried to DynaMesh at a pretty high resolution. And these are already decimated, so it's hard to tell. But the edges aren't always clean and crisp and perfect. So there's, there's always a little bit of rounding out that happens. And that's all right, because when you 3D print something, you're going to have to dip it in isopropyl alcohol and do some sanding and manual cleanup anyway. So any issues you have around the edges, they tend to go away during that part of the process. So I don't worry too much about those. Uh, but I do try to make sure that all of my edges are smooth and clean and that there aren't any floating, just freeform, flat pieces around the edges. And those I just try to delete, you know, what I do is I use the select lasso, select any of the edges that are being weird or just too thin or wonky, and I hide them and then I delete them. Under geometry, modify topology, delete hidden. And then when you DynaMesh and Sculpt, you can clean up most of them. All right, hope that answered that question. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, does DynaMesh have something to do with the scale of the model? Yep, it definitely does. Uh, ZBrush's DynaMesh system is localized to the scale of working in ZBrush. So it doesn't always mean the same thing. Sometimes you have to do 80 resolution, sometimes you have to do two or 3,000 resolution, that all, that all depends on what, sky, si, what scale you're working at. Right now, with this model, let me put it back together, I'm working in real world scale. So I tested this out in Maya to make sure that it was eight inches tall. And from there, I brought that model into ZBrush and built my entire scene around real world scale. So for me, around 300 uh, resolution for DynaMesh in real world scale, gives pretty good results. But it's gonna be completely different depending on what scale you're working at. All right, next question is, does the keying technique apply for printer like SLA or can you implement them for FDM as well? Uh, both. Um, the keys uh, that we're gonna be doing in class are pretty basic. They work on FDM and SLA prints. So I don't have an example of an FDM print that is keyed but I do have an articulated version. So let me show you that. Okay. All right. So do you guys see this little uh, rubber band ray gun that I've got here? So this was all 3D printed and it actually functions. It works by pulling the trigger. And all of these parts that you see are different FDM pieces that are all keyed into each other. 
So if I show you, let's see if I can bring up the way this was keyed. So you can see all of the pieces here that were keyed together. These are all just long squares or circles, but it's the same process for FDM or for SLA. You do have to print larger than your build area and sometimes you wanna print different colors. So that keying is very useful for that. All right, so let's see here. Um, Art by Sua is asking, what level of knowledge of ZBrush should we have for the class? I had beginner experience, but I haven't touched it in almost a year. Um, so this is 3D printing for ZBrush artists. And I presume you guys have a basic understanding of ZBrush, but I do tend to go much slower in my class than in the webinar. I'm trying to just cover a lot of information and get through a very long process. Um, but in the class, we go pretty slowly. So if you're familiar with navigating around ZBrush, and you watch the tutorials you know, at a slow pace, you can definitely keep up with the class. Um, it'll get a bit more advanced as we get to week six, seven, and eight. Um, but until the first five or six weeks, we go pretty slow for sure. So if you want to give it a shot, you can try it. Let's see. All right, cool. Next question is, let's see. Could you remind us where we find the key creation button? Um, there isn't a key creation button by default. Um, we actually in the class create it. So in the brush palette, you'll see here the IMM keys. That's a brush that we create in class, which goes over uh, tapered keys, round keys, and a couple of other ones. And later on, we've got an articulation brush as well. So we go over creating a ball joint and a hinge joint. And we can do all this in ZBrush. So you don't need an external application to even make these guys. All right, good, lots of questions here. Okay. Did I get these? Okay. All right, Ted says, let's see, how did I set up the cutter mesh so when you dynamesh it with the body, it's subtracted instead of combined? Um, uh, hard to explain the whole process all over again, but you basically have to set up the cutter mesh. You just have to click on this little moon icon rather than the two circles, and then it becomes a cutter. And you can also, you know, just double your bet by going under geometry or polygroups and group as dynamesh sub. And that way, when you merge it with another piece, and then you dynamesh, it's going to be a cutter for sure. Okay. All right, let's see. Ruben's asking, when using the keying technique with the rotational IMM key, does it work like a pop-in joint? Uh, it depends on what you're using. Um, the insert mesh brush for the tapered square, that's not going to work as pop-in. That's going to be one time you epoxy it together and it's solid. Um, and it doesn't rotate. But if you use a snap-in pin for your shoulder, then you'll be able to do a full rotation, 360 degrees. So you do use the same keying technique, but you're using a different kind of key and cutter. All right, Andrew is asking, did you hollow the tapered square key in the head to hold glue? Um, no, not for the head in particular. Um, what he's referring to is the head model right here. Whoop. Solo that out and zoom into it. So you can see it's hollowed out. And if I hide half the mesh, you can see what it's looking like on the inside. Display properties, double. So you can see I hollow pretty conservatively. Any pieces that are you know, going to be pretty thin and light, I leave them completely solid. And the face details I didn't want to mess around with, so I left them completely, you know, like a pretty thick amount of resin in there. I just wanted to save some material. That's the primary purpose of hollowing, is to save on your resin material so that you can make stretch this further and do a lot more printing. All right, next question is, 
do you ever go more than 100K polys per decimated subtool? Um, I personally don't. Um, I think Formlab software preform can handle maybe 200,000 polys. Don't quote me on that, but I, it can handle more than 100,000 polys. But I tend to decimate all my separate pieces to about 100K or less. Um, just because, you know, all, all the all printers aren't made equal. And I want to teach a class that covers all sorts of printers. And so best practice is to make it less than 100K polys. All right. Um, Jake's asking, do you UV cure before sanding and polishing? Um, yeah, I, I generally UV cure, um, make the model completely solid, then remove the supports, then sand and polish. Sometimes the supports come off really easy, so I'll just remove them before curing, uh, but I'll still cure and then sand and polish the mesh. And in the class, we're actually gonna be covering a lot of physical techniques of how to sand uh, and polish and clean up the supports. All right, uh, Livio's asking, are you using the new 3D Print Hub plugin? Um, that's a new plugin in, the, in ZBrush that was released in December. I am using it, but I didn't want to show it for the purpose of this webinar. Um, it's pretty good at exporting out to correct scale, but I'm going to show a couple of different ways of doing that. Uh, exporting a model out to Mesh Mixer and getting the correct scale there, a different 3D software, and splitting and hollowing there as well. So we'll, we'll cover 3D Print Hub as well as uh, a few other techniques. All right, Juno's asking, why are the builds printed at an angle? I'm not sure what you're talking about by the builds. Um, are, you may be asking about why was it printed at an angle? Um, that I can show you. Let's see here. Mm, all right. So usually when you print uh, in SLA, it's rising, you know, it prints one layer at a time. So if you print at an angle and you add supports, it's usually a much stronger, safer print. Uh, than trying to print flat and making it go the entire length of the layer. So if you go like, think about like an upside down pyramid shape. If you start at like a small point and then build upwards, uh, that's generally for stereolithography, a better way to print. Um, it, you're less likely to have failures. You're less likely to have anything sticking to the build plate. It's just different than the FDM print process. All right, uh, Jake's asking, is there a benefit to printing white instead of gray resin? Uh, good question. Um, when you print in white, um, and this is really de you know, depends on who you ask, but for my personal testing, I found that clear resin and white resin, uh, I can use the trays for longer because the laser that uh, heats everything up to solidify, it is actually at a lower temperature than the darker resin. So if you use gray or black, your laser is stronger and it tends to burn out the trays quicker. Uh, not by much, maybe by just one or two model prints, but it, that's why I tend to prefer printing in white and clear. Um, if you're asking about priming, uh, any color that you print, you're gonna have to prime it because if you don't uh, and your print is exposed to UV light for a month or two, uh, it's going to become brittle over time. So you have to prime it in order to avoid it becoming brittle. All right. Anonymous asking, the same procedure has to be done if you want a 3D print 3D model ready with paint from ZBrush. Okay, so if you're asking about paint and for, let's see, how to print in color, we go over that and here's like a 3D print that was done in color. It's like a Shapeways 3D color printed piece. And that's actually a completely different process. It's an export to VRML, which is a different kind of file, not an FBX or STL file. And I'm gonna cover that in a different uh, demo, I imagine, because it's, it's, a, it's quite a bit different process. You can use the color from ZBrush, but you do need to create a UV map and export a VRML file with the model and the UV map uh, and the texture map so that it can, you put it in a zip file actually and upload it. So it's a different process, but yes, we covered that in the class. All right, Matthias is asking about the resin. Yeah, about half a liter for the hem. Let's see. During the class, is it possible to get advice on pricing, not to compete? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I have no problem hiding how much prints cost or, you know, any of that. It's, it's important to learn the process. 
All right, uh, James is saying, Joseph Dress says Dynamesh Master as a big help for controlling resolution and size. Yes, Dynamesh Master is a plugin. Uh, it does help a lot, but I wanna show you guys both processes. Um, just default ZBrush, um, Dynamesh Master, and then also the uh, export to Mesh Mixer and another application to just do your correct sizing and hollowing there. All right, let's see here. Carlos is asking, could you share the key brush? <laughs> um, well, it's kind of one of the things we make in class. The tapered square is not hard to make. If you want to make that, I can show you that very quickly. All you need to do is start with a cube, go make it a poly mesh 3D, and then under the deformations tab, you can do a taper. And there you go, there's your key brush. What I'd recommend is probably duplicating this and inflating a bit. So it's a bit larger than your previous key. And if I turn on transparent mode, you can see what's going on. Well, I guess you can't really see it, but, oh, solo is on, that's why. So I've got my mesh here. The cutter is a bit larger than the key. So you can see the key in there in transparent mode. And you decimate both of these together, merge them down, and then you can create your own insert mesh brush under create insert mesh. And then there you go. There's your key in the brush you just created. So you can see it draws it out. And then you can split it and then, uh, I mean, auto group split and then use it as one as the cutter, one as the key. So yeah, feel free to make your own, but in the class we make uh, quite a few more. <clears throat> All right, Andrew's asking, how toxic is the resin and plastic to work with? Does it hurt your lungs or throat? Um, I personally don't think it's very toxic, but I always wear my safety uh, gloves and uh, my a mask when I'm uh, doing, working with this stuff. So I wear like a ventilation mask uh, when I'm sanding and painting. I wear glasses uh, when I'm, you know, cutting the supports off. Safety is always kind of a first thing, but um, I don't know if you guys can see it, but my printer is right there on the side of my work area and it's printing all the time and I haven't noticed any toxic effects in the room. All right. Um, okay, joint brush too. Let's see, Jake's asking, what was your role on the Overwatch statues? How they were done by Steve Wang Studios? Um, yeah, so Steve Wang uh, is the co-owner of Alliance Studios, him and Eddie Wang, and they actually hired me to contract work on that project with them. So I was working at Alliance Studio with them on that project. So it's definitely their project, along with Blizzard and EGADS and um, the whole Blizzard team. Um, so it was quite a lot of people involved in making that. I, I don't want to take uh, any credit for doing all of that by myself. All I did was a small part on Genji helping to prep him for 3D print. All right, so awesome. That's all the questions here in the Q&A. That was good. I answered kind of like all of those. <laughs> that was a lot of questions. In a row. <laughs> good job. Thank um, you, Ed. Cool. So, uh, hey, everybody, thanks for coming by. I apologize for those technical difficulties in the, in the beginning. But I'm glad you guys stuck through it. Yep. I hope you learned some good stuff. Eamon, you know, parted some awesome wisdom today. So, oh, one last thing I didn't mention, um, I put it in the chat, but we actually, you guys actually get a 3D print um, in class for your final. So, Mole 3 d will actually 3D print your final from a, a Form 2 printer and, and ship it to you as part of the cost of, of the class. Also, we partnered up with Formlabs, and Formlabs is offering students who buy a Form 2 printer a free bottle of resin. That's only to our school. So, so buy the Form 2 and you get a free bottle of resin, which I think it's like 150 bucks. That's basically it, guys. So hopefully we, we'll see you in class. Uh, registration ends at the end of the month. Again, this uh, discount code, I'm going to email it out to everyone, but it's only uh, good for, I think it's a week or two weeks. So definitely make sure to take advantage of that. And uh, yeah, thanks again for, for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. All right, I'll see you guys around. All right, take Good. care, guys.